So hello everyone. My name is Lou Orslein and I'm from the Job Accommodation Network. We, we're contract funded by the U.S. D uh, Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. And JAN provides workplace accommodation solutions, consultation on Title I of the ADA, and also information about self-employment for people with disabilities. Today I'm going to talk a bit about techniques for creating workplace accommodations, accommodation policies and procedures. As I begin, when I think about this topic, I always think that really employers, if you can get the accommodation piece right, then you're offering equal employment and you're me meeting your compliance obligations. And if you're getting accommodation right and you're meeting your compliance obligations, then you're creating that inclusive workplace culture that we're all working towards. So one of the five elements I believe of a inclusive workplace are an inclusive ethos. And that means particularly language. Um, everyone needs educated in disability etiquette. And you need to ensure that there's not any offensive language being used. Inclusive public relations and marketing. Physical accessibility is important. Enabling workplace technologies. Those technologies that enable everybody in the workplace, including people with disabilities, to be productive and engaged in the workplace and receive all the benefits of employment. And inclusive policies and practices. And today I'm going to focus just a, a bit on those policies and practices. So in creating an inclusive workplace environment, you need to really look at what's your policy. You need a value statement. Something that really spells out the value proposition for your organization, for individuals with disabilities in hiring, retaining, and advancing. The purpose, who's covered, what is reasonable accommodation, and when exactly is it provided? What's your interactive process? Jan offers a six-step interactive process that can be replicated or adapted to your environment, but what's your specific process? You need to let people know that not all accommodations can be honored. And then what are the roles and responsibilities of everyone in the process? And of course, it needs to include confidentiality. Medical information needs to be kept separate from everyone else's um, personnel files, and that information is very confidential. And then what's your practice? Whose responsibility is it? to request an accommodation. You need to spell that out in your practice so that everyone knows whose responsibility it is. What happens after the request? Who does it go to? What's your internal process? Who's involved? What are all the touch points for communication? What's the time frame? So often we find that there isn't any time frame. And as we know, if there isn't a time frame spelled out, oftentimes things don't get done. So time frames are essential to a good accommodation practice. What happens if there's a delay? How is that communicated to the individual who's requested the accommodation? What's a temporary accommodation and how that's provided? How is that provided? And how, does that, how is that different from a more permanent accommodation? Who communicates the, the determination? So is there an appeals process? Again. This is something that we're not seeing in a lot of policies that we believe is really important. Sometimes subjective decisions are made by good-meaning people and they hold people with disabilities back in the workplace. You need for that process to be more normalized and institutionalized and for there to be less subjectivity. And an appeals process enables that. So how are accommodations tracked? Do you have a spreadsheet that you're tracking them? Do you have? an accommodation tracking system. That's one of the best in emerging practices is to have an accommodation tracking system. If you don't have a tracking system, the problem that comes up time and time again is a new supervisor comes in that isn't aware of the accommodations that are being offered to people. And then people, individuals with disabilities, employees, end up in performance improvement plans. Um, and that's just, the, that's just a very bad outcome of somebody asking for an accommodation. So some of the basics of accommodation are reasonable accommodation really is the interactive process. 
And your reasonable accommodation policy and process is really the basis for inclusion in your organization. And the foundation for reasonable accommodation is what's called the interactive process or the dialogue from the individual with disabilities with the employer representative who manages the process. And the trigger for reasonable accommodation in the interactive process is really the request for an accommodation from the individual or a recognition of an obvious disability and barrier to work. For instance, if someone is a wheelchair user and they're not able to get into the restroom or into the employee lounge where everyone else, that everyone else uses. And a, and a request for accommodation includes two essential elements. And this is really important that everyone in your organization be trained to. The, the request really needs to contain a medical condition and a challenge at work. So those paired really become the disclosure for reasonable accommodation. Now what are the most common types of reasonable accommodations? What we find is that employers at times get stuck because they've provided an accommodation for one individual with a specific disability. And then it, the tendency is, and I think it's normal for all of us, that the tendency is to just think, well, okay, well that person needed this, so the next person who has low vision or is blind um, needs this accommodation. So in an effort really to kind of get us out of that thinking, I wanted to offer the various types, eight, eight really common types that we see most often at the Job Accommodation Network. And that's modifying schedule or allowing leave time. And this is, this is a very frequent um, request as an accommodation. Making an, a workplace or workstation accessible. Modifying methods, testing, communication, or training. And when this particularly comes up, and we all need to be aware of, is during the talent acquisition um, um, process. So what you have is you have somebody that perhaps is using an applicant tracking system and they get timed out because of their cognitive disability or an agility issue with, with their hands and typing. So it's really important for you to consider modifying that method. Push back against the vendor. Ask if that timing mechanism can be changed with the applicant tracking system to ensure accessibility. Ultimately, if there is no accommodation uh, that can be uh, used or that can be uh, used to accommodate the individual with a disability in this process, then you need to provide an alternate way for them to, to apply. Modifying or creating policies. If you have someone with diabetes uh, and they're working in a call center and the policy is that there's no food or drink at their workspace, then you may need to modify that policy so that they can bring a small refrigerator and that they can have food there um, for when they need it or drink. Purchasing and modifying equipment or products. That's something that most of us are most familiar with. But there is an assistive technology for every kind of disability, impairment, and challenge at work. So let me just remind you of that um, because we often just want to plug and play these days. And assistive technology is not going to solve all. As a matter of fact, really most accommodations are really strategies or techniques. They're not necessarily assistive technology. Purchasing a service like a reader or an interpreter or restructuring a job, modifying a job description so that, you, um, so that you carve out the marginal tasks and the person just really needs to focus on their essential functions. And then of course the sort of the last ditch kind of accommodation which is reassignment. So if um, you have tried numerous times to accommodate a person in a specific job that they were qualified for, then you will want to consider reassignment um, and see if there's another open position that they can perhaps be qualified in in your organization. And then there's various other accommodations such as telework, um, adjusting supervisory method, and um, using a service animal at work. Now what is the interactive process? Basically this conversation or dialogue is a collaborative effort. So really, some, at some times, um, employers really leave the individual with a disability out of this dialogue. 
um, and the dialogue exists between HR and benefits or HR and leave people or um, other people or other um, sort of departments within the organizational structure. It's really essential that from the request for accommodation, the disclosure and request for accommodation, that the individual um, be involved. If you have a good interactive process, it creates that standard of practice. It normalizes the practice in the organization. It facilitates communication and inclusion. It, of course, demonstrates good faith, that you're engaging in good faith as you're negotiating accommodations. And, of course, it leads to compliance. Now, what is the six-step interactive process that Jan finds can be effective for employers? Recognizing an accommodation request. And again, as I spoke before, there are two pieces to that. There's the medical condition, and then there's the challenge at work related to that medical condition. So you need everyone to be able to recognize that. And perhaps your supervisors in your policy aren't the ones who provide accommodations, but they need to recognize that accommodation has been requested so that they can then refer a person to human resources, employee relations, or your diversity inclusion, wherever your accommodation process um, sets. You need to gather information from sources like um, the Job Accommodation Network, from the individual with the disability, from other service providers perhaps. Explore accommodation options. The first option you choose may not be the best and may not work. And what you really may want to do if, you, if the accommodation is in question as to whether it will be effective, effective is just to put a trial accommodation in place. Sign a little contract with your employee that says, we're going to try this for the next six weeks. If this doesn't work, we're going to move to the next. You need to choose an accommodation. Of course, the employer can certainly has the right under the law to choose the accommodation, but it must be effective for the individual. Implement the accommodation. Make sure that if you do end up buying a piece of assistive technology, that you have somebody from, the I, from your IT team make sure that that assistive technology works with the other technologies, software, hardware, um, within your organization. Or, that, or the individual with disability is still really not going to be as productive as they can possibly be. So you need to ensure that. And of course, monitor the accommodation over time because things change in all of our environments. So some of the techniques for creating inclusion are beyond policies and just practices, or really adopt a mindset that your workplace needs to be accessible for all. We call it universal design. And this really reduces the need for individualized assessment and accommodations. Focus on diverse abilities. Instead of focusing on disability, Make sure that you can really, that you really have, again, the culture and the mindset that really looks at strengths and looks at abilities and builds upon those abilities. Certainly don't focus on the diagnosis of someone. That's really not going to tell you very much about how they contribute to your workplace. Gather, and re gather um, meaningful metrics. So what you want to do is you want to have an accommodation tracking system, even in Excel format, and you want to have those metrics so that you can present, so that you know how effective your system is being. You want to know how many accommodations are requested, how many accommodations are provided, how many are denied, how many are appealed. That really tells you uh, and gives you the information you can need to improve upon your processes. I'll say utilize and leverage commonly requested accommodations. So if you're in a retail situation uh, and you have um, a cashier uh, that's requesting uh, a sit, a sit uh, a stand stool uh, because that is more comfortable in them uh, checking people out um, efficiently, then consider that being a tool for others. So if others request that, recognize the improvement this makes in the environment and then catalog that. So make sure that your supervisors know this is a regularly accepted accommodation. Um, so if someone asks this, you don't need to go through the entire interactive process. Just provide this tool. Other tips are develop a list of pre-approved accommodations. So again, if there are ready accommodations, easy accommodations that you can provide, expand this to a catalog that 
human resources, DNI, ER, they have this catalog so they know again readily provide the accommodation, don't need to go through an exhaustive interactive process. Develop a task bank of jobs. Say for instance you have someone coming back from chemotherapy who has cancer and you really want to bring them back into the workplace, keep them engaged so that you don't lose that talent. Then perhaps they can do another task. Some, they can help another department for a short time. Integrate and harmonize your model. Have a single point of leave and accommodation oversight. Have your internal value proposition and make sure that everyone in your organization is aware of it. Training and more training. It seems like you can really not train people enough on this. Build out from a successful return to work program. If you're providing accommodations in return to work and that's successful, then replicate that and create an accommodations program from that success. Purchase and develop a tracking system. Make sure you use your out um, side resources. Create a centralized accommodation fund. Ensure the accessibility of your career portal and your applicant tracking system. Embed at least one IT accessibility expert in your IT team. Have them trained by the International um, Association of Accessibility Professionals so that they can be the voice of accessibility in all of the products and services that you use. Provide boilerplate accessibility contract language with providers and vendors. So set the expectation with those vendors that you use that you're going to expect accessibility in your applicant tracking system and your other information systems that you purchase from them. So for, for, for more information on this topic and others, please contact the Job Accommodation Network.